Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Erin Plant and I'm a public engagement coordinator at the Trust for the National Mall. We are the leading nonprofit philanthropic partner of the National Park Service here on the National Mall where our mission is to preserve, restore, and enrich. One way we do that is by supporting our friends at the Park Service and bringing the important stories represented on the National Mall into the classroom. I am so thrilled to host park ranger Susan Philpott of Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument, a unit of National Mall Memorial Parks and the home to the National Women's Party. Susan is a fantastic storyteller and will take us on a journey today on the 50th anniversary of the passing of the Equal Rights Amendment as we explore women's fight for equality from the passing of the 19th Amendment, to the passing of the ERA and beyond. I encourage you to look at some of our other virtual classroom programs at nationalmall.org under the Explore tab, where the recording of this program will live in the near future if you would like to revisit it. So I encourage everyone to use the chat throughout the program, share your comments, and ask plenty of questions as we learn together. Thank you so much, Susan, for leading our virtual classroom today and sharing with all of us. So with that, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for hosting this great discussion today. Um, so um, as we go through this presentation, feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat. I won't be able to see them, but uh, probably, but Erin will be watching for me. And um, if there's uh, something that we wanna talk about along the way, we'll do that. And we'll also take questions at the end. Um, and when we get to the end, I'm going to ask the students who are participating to help us out by taking a quick survey. So I'll provide a link to that survey as well. Okay, so here we go with our share. Are you seeing my screen there? We all good? Okay, great. Looks good. Okay, so uh, as Erin mentioned, uh, I am Park Ranger Susan Philpott, and um, my site is a little bit of a mouthful, the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument. And today we're going to be talking about the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, or ERA for short. And what's the story with the Equal Rights Amendment anyway? Um, so this is the park where I work. If you think of, of parks and you're often thinking of the wide open spaces and landscapes, um, the National Park Service also tells um, the stories of our history as well. And my site, which is part of the National Mall, uh, is actually on the other side of the Capitol from like the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. We're at the corner of Constitution Avenue and Second Street Northeast, right across from the Supreme Court. And that white building you see, the, the house kind of sits in the elbow of, that's the Hart Senate Office Building. So there's some senators who have their offices looking out over us. Um, you'll notice in this picture, there's some scaffolding there. Um, this is a 200 year old house and uh, old houses need a lot of work and we've got a rehabilitation project going on right now. The reason this is part of the National Park Service is because it was the historic headquarters of the National Women's Party founded by Alice Paul and that will come in prominently in our discussion. So this is looking at the inside of what is now a museum. So it was once, you know, a, a political headquarters, a spot for lobbying, a place for women to gather um, and fight for women's equality. Um, it became a museum um, hosted by the National Women's Party beginning in 1997. And then in 2016, it became part of the National Park Service. And we began telling the stories from here, which as you can tell from this entranceway, maybe is, is a place where we, we honor and we celebrate women. So today, we're gonna be asking the question, does the constitution guarantee equal rights for all? So if you'd like to put your thoughts in the chat or talk with each other or just vote yes or no, what do you think? There's no right or wrong answer to that question. That's just the thing we're gonna be exploring. Does the constitution guarantee equal rights for all? Well, we know that there have been 20 of times throughout uh, American history, the history of America, when it certainly was not guaranteeing equal rights for all. Um, and there's lots of 
um, areas that we could explore about this. Today, we're going to talk specifically about the issue of people who uh, um, do not have equal rights based on sex. Um, this is a picture in the museum with that stained glass window behind you there looking down the hallway and you can see we've got pictures and, and busts, those white marble statues. And the one that you see closest to you here, you might recognize as Susan B. Anthony. If people know one name in the uh, cause of women's rights in the United States, they usually have heard of Susan B. Anthony because she spent, uh, she was born in 1820 and she spent pretty much her entire adult life on the road campaigning for women's rights. And maybe you've heard of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. There's a bust of her in the museum on the right and a, and a photograph of her when she was younger on the left. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is one of the organizers of what we kind of mark as the first time that people in this country got together specifically to talk about women's rights. And that is the July 1848 Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. And the National Park Service cares for that site. It's called Women's Rights National Historic Park. Uh, um, recreation of the Wesleyan Chapel where um, about 300 radicals uh, met to talk about the issue of women's rights. And they based their discussion, not on the constitution, but on an earlier founding document, the Declaration of Independence. And they kind of wrote their own version, their mission statement called the Declaration of Sentiments and corrected one part. They said, all men and women are created equal. And you can see on the left there, there's a, a, a small version of the Declaration of Sentiments and the signers below, which I know you can't read. Here's a, another um, scene of Women's Rights National Historic Park. They have a, a wall there where the whole Declaration of Sentiments is recorded, is, is carved. And you can see it's long. Most of it is a list of all the ways that women are not treated equally in 1848. So it's a long list. And they're talking about all kinds of things, how they're treated under the law, how they're treated economically and education and social issues and religion. Um, so they had a lot on the agenda. And one of the things they talked about, and actually it was the one that got people the most uh, concerned, was the most um, controversial was the issue of women's suffrage. Now that word suffrage, that's kind of a strange word. It sounds like suffer or suffering. It doesn't actually have anything to do with that, although plenty of people have suffered for suffrage. Um, the word suffrage just means the right to vote. So if women's suffrage means women's right to vote, to participate in the political process. And of all the things they were talking about, that one got people the most concerned. You know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, women voting, that's just going too far. Now, now you're just getting ridiculous. The way Elizabeth Cady Stanton said it at the, at the um, meeting was, she said, it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. That's another word you'll hear, or to say enfranchise, to enfranchise someone is to give them the right to vote. Um, to be enfranchised is to have the right to vote. So those are a couple of words that all have to do with voting. And eventually, um, women began to really focus on the vote. The idea that if you want the rest of the things on the list, you got to have the vote, because without the vote, you don't have the power to get the rest of the things. Now, the Constitution doesn't deal too much with, the, um, with voting, at least it certainly didn't in its original form. But one of the things that is in the US Constitution from all the way back in 1789 is the ability to change it. And when you change it, we call that an amendment. So to amend or to change the Constitution, uh, there's a process to it. And it's, it's a pretty tough process. Um, the first thing is you have to pass the amendment through the US Congress with a two thirds majority. So more than just a simple majority, two thirds majority. Um, the most famous maybe amendments that you might know about are the Bill of Rights. They were passed right away. As soon as the US Constitution goes to an effect, pretty quickly they start to deal, the country starts to deal with the things that are left out of the original language that they need to deal with. Um, so 
Bill of Rights, maybe you're familiar with the First Amendment, granting freedom of speech, or the Second Amendment, uh, the right to bear arms. On, on the right here, you see the uh, original Bill of Rights. Um, and actually, it's kind of small, so you probably might not be able to see it. But if you looked closely, the ones that are listed here as the first and the second are not what you would think of as the first and, and second amendment. Um, the one that says article the third is the one that starts out with um, what we now call the first amendment. And that's because there's more to an amendment than just passing it through uh, Congress. The second part is you have to get it ratified or approved by three quarters of the state, 75% of the state. So the first two amendments that passed didn't get ratified. There's words here that say not ratified. So they didn't make it all the way through the process. Um, so the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Over the history, there have been 27. Now, my history professor used to always say that there was one that was most important. And it wasn't the first or the second or the fifth. It was the 14th. The 14th Amendment was passed and ratified right after the Civil War in 1869. And it was for the first time saying, who is a citizen of the United States? And what are the rights of a citizen? So there's a lot of language to it. It's handwritten on the right and too um, fit, uh, faint to read. But I've included some of it here on the left of the screen. So a lot of words, the ones that people pay attention to the most of is that for all citizens, all citizens get due process of law and equal protections under the law. And if you notice, it says all persons. It doesn't say all men. There is a part in the amendment that includes the word male in the constitution for the first time, but it says all persons are citizens with due process, equal protection. So this is 1869. This is 21 years after that uh, Seneca Falls Convention. And people, women had been fighting for the vote all this time. And what happens in 1869 is one of the things that women start to do is argue that the 14th Amendment already gives them the right to vote because they are citizens and they should have rights. And it didn't work. Women didn't win the vote through the 14th Amendment. So the story we tell at our site is the story of people, women who take up the fight for the vote after those founding mothers like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton had died. And particularly, we talk about Alice Paul, who founded her organization, the National Woman's Party. This is a picture of Alice Paul with one of her fabulous hats. Those were very stylish at the time. Um, she was very young. She was in her early mid-20s when she started the fight. And she really believed that it was a fight for rights, that trying to convince people through speeches and writing uh, petitions or editorials wasn't getting anybody anywhere. And that what women needed to do was cause a little bit more trouble, be a little more, more confrontational. So the National Women's Party did a lot of things in the fight for women's vote. One of the things they're best known for is for picketing the White House. They are the first ones who ever protested at the White House. So if you've ever been there, or seen pictures and seen people protesting out there, know that it was Alice Paul and the National Women's Party who started it. So here you see some picketers out at the White House. Um, it's a black and white photo, so you can't tell, but you can see that they're wearing sashes and they also have banners that have three colors on them. Those colors are purple, white, and gold. Those were kind of their trademark colors. Um, they didn't have to have any words, everybody knew that as kind of their trademark. And so if they saw a woman with that sash or holding that banner, they knew, oh, that is a suffragist. That's the word for someone who's fighting for the right to vote. As far as I know, the question. Yes. Sorry, we have a question about this photo. Is one yes. of them wearing roller skates? So I was just about to say, as far as I know, the roller skater is not part of the protest. I think it's just a girl roller skating by, but I'd love the idea of roller skating for suffrage. That's why I love this photo. So, so maybe, but, but uh, I don't think she's actually part of the protest. 
Um, and you'll also notice that a couple of those banners have words on them. Now, maybe you think of that as something that happens when people protest, they carry signs. Well, these were really the first um, protesters who used great big banners with big bold block lettering on it that anybody could read. Um, now, one of the reasons they're at the White House is because they are fighting for Woodrow Wilson, the US president, to start supporting women's right to vote. So a lot of the banners were a uh, addressed to Woodrow Wilson. Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? You see on the left. On the right, my favorite one. The young are at the gates. So this idea that, you know, this fight for the right to vote has been going on for generations. We are the new young uh, people who are not going to take this line down. We are going to fight for our rights. Um, and the way they thought they needed to do that was to amend the Constitution. So this is a, one of the banners that showed up a lot. We demand an amendment to the US Constitution enfranchising women. Now the story of that amendment, which became the 19th Amendment is a fantastic story. We're not gonna tell that story today because we're, we're dealing with a different amendment, but that nine, this is the wording of the 19th Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Uh, the word abridged means to change or to treat somebody differently. So you can't say someone can't vote because of their sex. You can't change the rules about who can vote based on sex. Um, and that amendment became part of the US Constitution in 1920 after a long battle since 1848, 72 years. This is Alice Paul raising her glass and toast in celebration. The amendment is passed through Congress and was ratified by three quarters of the states. Uh, victory. So the 19th Amendment became part of the US Constitution on August 26, 1920. So now that that's been fixed for that, now does the Constitution guarantee equal rights for all? We've got the 14th, we've got the 19th. What do we think? Well, this is what Alice Paul had to say. She said, it's incredible to me that any woman should consider the fight for full equality one. It has just begun. There's hardly a field, economic or political, in which the natural and unaccustomed policy is not to ignore women. That's Alice Paul over there on the right with another fabulous hat. So Alice Paul says, no, the vote's not the end. The vote is just the beginning. Now we have to keep fighting. Uh, and that's why we have a, a headquarters where we do. They didn't move into that until 1929. So nine years after women won the vote, they were still fighting. And one of the things they did is they updated the Declaration of Sentiments. They came up with a new list called the Declaration of Principles. These are just some of the things on the list, all the ways women are still being treated unequally. And this is a cartoon by one of their cartoonists, Nina Allender. This is the spirit of Susan B. Anthony has arrived um, to uh, talk to those newly enfranchised women. You see the women there have in their hands the vote, but she's pointing on that bill of rights and the caption on the cartoon is all but the vote is still to be won. So I, I just had to show you this picture because I love it. They had uh, the National Women's Party called a convention in Seneca Falls, New York on the 75th anniversary of um, the Women's Rights Convention and um, they, one of the things they would do is they would do pageants um, where they would dress up in costumes and demonstrate the history of women. Sometimes they had what they called tableaus, which this is where everybody sort of stands like a statue to demonstrate some scene. This is a scene from ancient history, women warriors. Uh, so their version of TikTok, I guess. Um, and so they had this convention with the pageants and the celebrations, and they said, okay, now it's the next phase. We need to go back to that idea of amending the US Constitution, this time not for the vote, but for full equality. And so at that convention, they came up with a new amendment, who they named for Lucretia Mott, who was another uh, early woman suffragist who organized the Seneca Falls Convention. 
and they called it the uh, Lucretia Mott Amendment. And the wording was, men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and in every place subject to its jurisdiction. Sounds right, right? Equal rights for everybody. Here is another cartoon of the spirits of the, the women pioneers who had gone before encouraging the new woman in, now in the 20th century with that Lucretia Mott Amendment. Well, hold on a minute. These women, in addition to having just amazing hats, um, are suffragists themselves. They had fought for the right to vote. They were part of a new organization called the League of Women Voters. So they're voters. They believe in participating in the political process, but they say, wait a minute, Alice Paul, that amendment of yours, that's going too far now. We don't need that, that equal rights amendment. That is a mistake. And Alice Paul was kind of shocked that all these women who had fought for the vote were not then part of her uh, idea to keep going, to change the Constitution again. And the way she said to herself, this is Alice Paul again, she said, the problem is not the Senate or the con Congress or the president. So no more picketing and protesting and pressuring the politicians, she said, because now we're voters and we have the power. What she thought is that what the problem was changing the thought of the American women, that women had internalized the idea that they were inferior. Um, and so now the new mission would be to convince women that they deserved equal rights. Now, that's probably uh, a partly an accurate assessment of what was going on. Women have grown up in a society that tells them that they're not equal. And so the idea of what would equality based on sex, having equal rights, what would that look like? So a little hard to, anytime there's change, it's hard to grapple with. Um, but there's more to the story, as there often is. Remember that long list of things that women are fighting for. One of the things that women have been fighting for all along is for safety and protection in the workplace. More and more women are going to work in places like factories, like you see in this picture. Um, and they're in a situation where they often get exploited and mistreated. The, the working conditions are dangerous and they have to work long, long hours and kids have to work too. Um, and so one of the reform movements has been fighting for rights for workers. And one of the places where they've made some gains is in getting protective legislation, protective laws for women in the workplace that are different than men's. How many hours they can work, under what conditions they can work so that women won't be exploited. And the fear of the labor organizers is that, well, this amendment is gonna throw all those laws out the window. And that's going to make things worse for women. This is another cartoon that's kind of the National Women's Party's answer to that. You see a, a young mother with her two kids cuddled up to her, and she's looking at something on a door that talks about the protection of her. A motherhood is the noblest profession in the world. But this is what they're saying the labor protection does. It says it means that women get inferior jobs, the lowest pay, and limited hours. Uh, except in the home, of course, where women have to do all the work. So that was their answer. Um, that was them trying to convince people that, no, we shouldn't have different rules for men and women. It should be protective legislation for everybody. It should be safe and fair for everybody. If you treat women differently as if they need protection, what you actually do is mean that they have an inferior situation, that things are worse for them. Um, they weren't really getting anywhere with the, with the Lucretia Mann Amendment. In 1943, the wording of the proposed amendment was changed. Uh, this is a, a wall in the museum at Belmont Paul with the words of the revised Equal Rights Amendment, which people then started calling the Alice Paul Amendment. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Sounds a lot like the 19th Amendment. Um, so, Instead of saying what the government has to do, like many other amendments, what this one is saying is what the government can't do. You can't uh, deny or abridge. You can't 
say that people don't have rights um, or they have different rights because of sex. So that's 1943. That's right around the time that uh, that nation is going to war and women are more and more not only uh, being involved in the military, but being involved in, in more and more um, areas of work on the home front. And so there's the push is continuing, but you can see this is going on for decades now, this fight. We're now, we're now 20 years in um, and the idea of an equal rights amendment and not still not really getting anywhere, even with the change. So I just want to take a minute and have everybody think about what about that question of equality not being fair? So if you have equal rights, that, that actually makes things not fair for women. That's the argument. So what do you think is the difference between fairness and equality? There's no right answer to that. It's just something to think about. Okay, so while you're thinking about, we'll pick up the story. So in our government, there is one place that says, well, we are the ones who decide what the Constitution says, and that is the Supreme Court. This is a picture of the Supreme Court building, which is right across Constitution Avenue from Belmont Hall. We look kind of at the side of the building. Uh, this is a picture of the front of the building. And you'll notice that engraved on the Supreme Court building is the words equal justice under the law. That at least where it comes to the law, things are supposed to be equal, is what the building says. But the Supreme Court makes decisions based on lawsuits that are brought to them about what the laws and the Constitution says, what you can do under the Constitution, what you can't. Um, when you say something, you can't do something based on the Constitution, we say that's unconstitutional. And in 1954, there's a very important Supreme Court decision. It's called Brown versus Board of Education. And this is a picture of a mural at the National Park Service site in Kansas that um, uh, tells the story of that history. Brown versus Board of Education has to do with racial segregation in schools setting up education in schools so that students are separated by race. You have a school where white students can go, a students where black students can go and, and different conditions for each of them. Now, up to this point, the Supreme Court had said that you could have segregation based on race as long as the two separated services were equal. But in 1954, the Supreme Court said, um, no, that's not right. That separate is unequal. That if you separate people by race, it's gonna be unequal. And what did they base that on? What did my history professor said? The answer is always the 14th Amendment, right? Based on the 14th Amendment, separate is inherently unequal. That's 1954, that's part of a movement that's been going on for a long time to fight for civil rights, for rights, uh, for an end to oppression and discrimination based on race. And that really brings about a new phase of the civil rights movement. You can see in the mural is Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr., probably two names you know from civil rights. Nine years after Brown versus Board of Education, there's a very important civil rights moment on the National Mar Mall. That's the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. You've probably seen pictures of, of Dr. King standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. This is another picture of that march and you can see some of the signs, right? They're protesting with signs. And what are they protesting for? Equal rights, decent housing, end to bias. Wait a minute, integrated schools. I thought nine years before, the Supreme Court said you had to have integrated schools. You couldn't have racially segregated schools. Well, that's one of the things that shows that it can be in the Constitution. It can even be that the Supreme Court says it. But unless somebody enforces it, things don't change. 
So even though nine years before the Supreme Court had told states that they had to desegregate their schools, they had to have integrated schools, it wasn't happening. So the civil rights movement is fighting for a number of different things. Here's another picture from the March on Washington. And you can see these signs, what are they saying? Voting rights is one of the things that are on there. Wait a minute, voting rights? There's another amendment to the constitution that came out to the 14th, right after the year uh, later, 1870. That's the 15th amendment that says you can't, states can't discriminate in voting based on race, except states are doing it. Here we are. Um, nearly a hundred years later, and states are still discriminating against people based on race. So what it turns out for all of these things is it's not enough for it to change the constitution. The 14th and the 15th amendment, the Supreme Court aren't changing things enough. What you need is a law and somebody enforcing it. So in 1964, there's a law called the Civil Rights Act that is supposed to get rid of racial segregation in all public areas, including education and jobs. Um, and the next year, there's the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that um, is supposed to change things so that everybody can vote, not just on sex, but based on race. You can't be denied or abridged based on race. Um, this is a picture of a postage stamp that the US Postal Service uh, issued to commemorate the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So there are a lot, often the pictures you see of the civil rights movement, the leaders that you think of, there are a lot of men. Right, it's men who are speaking during the March on Washington, Dr. King, um, maybe you know Stokely Carmichael or John Lewis. But women are involved in that movement too. And they start to see that they're getting discriminated on doubly. They're getting discriminated based on race, they're getting discriminated based on sex. And there's other women, maybe who haven't been involved in the civil rights movement, but who see what's happened in the civil rights movement, and they start to say, yes, we want to fight for our rights, too. So that's when you start a, a movement, the women, women's equality movement, sometimes called limit, women's liberation, also second wave feminism, who start to fight for women's rights in education, uh, in employment in under the law. And uh, you can see in this picture, this is a, a march. Uh, if you can see what's on these women's shirts, it says women on the move. So that sounds like a new version of the younger at the gates to me. These are the women are on the move and they are demanding rights. And if you look over on the right, uh, over here on the right, this is Betty Friedan in the in march. And you notice she's got a button on there. You notice what it says? ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. So this second wave feminism, they start to take up this amendment that Alice Paul had introduced um, so many years ago and they start fighting for it. Um, and here, here are some buttons in our display case. You can kind of see the reflection of me taking the picture on the left and you notice some of the ERA buttons including the one that, that's like the one Betty Friedan had on. Uh, equal Rights Amendment, ERA, yes, women are wearing buttons, they're wearing bracelets, they're getting the word out that they need to take up this Equal Rights Amendment as a way to guarantee equal rights based on sex. And they start doing some of the things that the National Women's Party had done. So those kind of visible confrontational things that get everybody's attention, uh, protest. National Women's Party hadn't really done that um, decades before, now these new second wave feminists start to do that. And 50 years ago today, they managed with bipartisan support to get the Equal Rights Amendment through Congress in a two thirds majority. This is a picture of the amendment. You notice the, the stamp says March 23rd. That's the, that's the day that the records office received it, but they passed it on March 22nd, 1972. 
passed it through Congress. Wow, they, we got it done. Except remember, there's two parts to amending the Constitution. The first part is passing it through Congress. But the second part is getting rat it ratified by three quarters of the states, 75%. To get 75%, they need 38 states to approve it, to ratify it. I want to point out over here again, um, one of these amendments that you see that was passed through Congress originally 1,789, 1,789, it passed through Congress, but it didn't get ratified by then. It got ratified 30 years ago this, this year in 1992. So over 200 years after it first passed through Congress, it was ratified, it's the 27th amendment. But the wording in the Equal Rights Amendment said you can't wait 200 years because it includes a clause that says, become part of the Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three fourths of the several states within seven years from the date of its submission by the Congress. So 72 plus seven, they had until 1979. Um, I met someone once who told me the story of coming to the National Women's Party headquarters um, right after this amendment passed 50 years ago and finding a very elderly Alice Paul there at the, at the um, headquarters. You know, she's coming over from Congress. They've just passed. She's coming in celebration. She found Alice Paul in tears because of that time limit. Alice Paul said that is going to kill the Equal Rights Amendment. The, the message that these uh, legislatures are sending to the country is if you can hold out for seven years, the Equal Rights Amendment will go away. It will die. And there are people who set out to make sure that happened. Now, at first, the amendments got bipartisan support and lots and lots of states are ratifying it. And they get 35 of the needed uh, 38 states by 1977. So they only need three more and they got a couple of years to go. But there is another wave of people who are opposing the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, the person I have in this picture here is probably the best known face of the Stop ERA campaign. Her name is Phyllis Schlafly, but she wasn't alone. She couldn't have done this alone. One of the things that Phyllis Schlafly was, was very good at is saying things in a way that made people angry. Maybe we'd call her a troll today. She, um, you can kind of tell from the sort of devilish grin on her face right here. She knew that she was saying provocative things, that she was stirring people up, that she was making people a little upset with the things that she was saying. That was part of her tactic to change the conversation about the Equal Rights Amendment. But she was saying things that people, that resonated with people, right? If, if she was just saying things to be mean, it wouldn't have done anything. But she said things like, wait a minute, women are the ones who get pregnant and have children. And women have to take care of the children. And women take care of the home. And this Equal Rights Amendment is going to make it unconstitutional some of the things we, laws and practices we have in place that take care of women while they take care of the family. Equality is not something that's gonna be good for women. Equality would be bad for women. Equality is something you should be afraid of. And here, are some of the things that people worried about. I just want to point out that the, you'll notice where these protesters against the Equal Rights Amendment are. They are protesting at the White House. So they're using Alice Paul's own technique against her amendment. But you can see some of the things they've got on their signs. Maybe they look familiar to, to things that people say today. You know, One of the things is that everything that's happening is a lie. Stop the web of deception. And also some things that people are worried about, some things that maybe people still think about. What happens if there's an equal rights amendment? Does that mean women will have to register for the draft in the military? 
probably. Um, what will that mean for women when, uh, for people when they are pregnant, when they are in having babies, when they have that physical change? What will it mean for uh, people who have uh, different bodies than what we think of as the male body? What will that mean? What will that mean for social security? What will it mean for the things that are put in place um, to protect women? And should women be protected in our society? So this changes the conversation. Um, it starts to make people angry. And when they're angry, they start yelling at each other instead of having conversations. Um, and it changes the public support for the Equal Rights Amendment. So we've got 35 um, states ratified by 1977, which is the year that Alice Paul dies, and then nothing. No more states are ratified. This is a march on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, DC in support of the Equal Rights Amendment. This picture is in color. So you can see that they're using those same colors that Alice Paul used. Uh, they're marching on the one year anniversary of Alice Paul's death. So they're marching in Alice Paul's honor uh, for Al the Alice Paul Equal Rights Amendment, wearing her colors and carrying the banners like women did before. They are marching to get the time limit on the Equal Rights Amendment uh, extended. Um, so they're running out of time um, and they're saying the Congress should pass an extension uh, on the time limit to get the um, amendment ratified. Um, and it works. They get an extension for three more years. So that takes them to 1982. Okay, we've got a few more years to get the Equal Rights Amendment ratified. This is a banner from the National Women's Party collection. It says ERA won't go away, but it did. 1982 deadline came and went, no more states ratified. The ERA is dead, um, three states short of the three quarters that they needed a ratification. So that's the end of the ERA story or so we thought. This is a map that I got from a group called ERA Action. None of these maps are anything that I created. I grabbed them from online. Um, the states in purple are the 35 states that had ratified by 1977. And then wait a minute, March, 2017, Nevada voted to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Wait, what? Decades after the time limit expired, a new state is ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment. Now people are talking about it again. Um, and then succession after that, Illinois voted to ratify. And in January, 2020, Virginia voted to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. So this map shows in green, 38 states having ratified. Okay, so Equal Rights Amendment, part of the US Constitution now, right? Nope. Um, the Department of Justice told the National Archivist, no, you cannot certify that that amendment is part of the US Constitution because Congress put a time limit on it and the time limit has expired. And just to keep things more interesting along the way as the, as the uh, opinion about the Equal Rights Amendment shifted, states that had ratified said they were rescinding, voted to rescind their ratification. Rescind is to cancel it. So they said, we don't ratify anymore. We're taking it back. Idaho, South Dakota, Nebraska, uh, Kentucky, and Tennessee, all those states said no more. We don't, we don't ratify the Equal Rights Amendment anymore. Can they do that? We don't know. That's one of the questions that will probably go to the Supreme Court for a decision. Also, three states, Alabama, Louisiana, and up here, South Dakota. Those three states have filed a lawsuit. That's one of the ways you get your voice heard in this country is through the courts. They filed a lawsuit to say that the Equal Rights Amendment should not be part of the US Constitution because the time limit expired. Yeah, if you want the Equal Rights Amendment, you've got to start all over again, start the process all over. Other states, Virginia, uh, Illinois, and Nevada have a, another lawsuit trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment 
into the US Constitution. So that's where we are right now. Things are working their way through the courts. Different decisions are being made. So, so watch the news about that. But remember the question that we had before, does the Constitution guarantee equal rights for all? Well, the woman in this picture started to argue that uh, although she thought that the Constitution needed an equal rights amendment, that there was protection, equal protection under the laws in the US Constitution already, where the answer is always, right, the 14th Amendment, in that clause in the 14th Amendment. I went, so when she was a young lawyer at uh, the ACLU, she practiced at the ACLU, so she had a hard time getting into law school. And then once she got her law degree and passed the bar, no firms would hire her because she was a woman. Uh, so in the 1970s, she started um, bringing cases to fight ways that men and women were treated unequally under the law. Sometimes when men were treated unequally under the law to say that this is wrong. Um, if you don't recognize her from this picture, maybe you recognize her in this picture. Uh, this is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She would eventually become a justice on the Supreme Court. So one of the people making the decisions. She started out uh, as a lawyer who was making the arguments. And she would often stop by the National Women's Party headquarters before uh, she went to the Supreme Court to make her arguments to get support from Alice Paul. Um, and she won a lot of cases. So based on those the Supreme Court decisions, there were several areas where the Supreme Court ruled that you couldn't treat men and uh, women differently under the law, that that was unconstitutional based on the 14th Amendment. She didn't win them all, but she won several of them. So there have been some decisions that said, yes, in limited circumstances, at least the US Constitution does support equality. Um, this is another picture of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg being interviewed with a fellow justice with whom she, she had a very close friendship, although they disagreed about just about everything um, under the law. On the right is uh, Justice Antonin Scalia. And in this interview, they're arguing about this, this issue, talking about this issue. And what Antonin Scalia said, is certainly the Constitution does not require discrimination on the basis of sex. The only issue is whether it prohibits it. So does the Constitution say that you cannot discriminate in the law based on sex? And this is his answer, at least. He says it doesn't. So Antonin Scalia said nothing in the US Constitution says um, that equality based on sex. Now, both of these Supreme Court justices have since passed away, but there are younger justices who are now on the court um, who follow the, the, the legal theories of each of these justices. So there are people on the court now who agree with Justice Scalia. There are people on the court now who agree with Justice Ginsburg. And these issues are probably going to continue to come to the Supreme Court for decisions. So the issue of equality based on sex is an issue that has continued to evolve in the nearly 100 years since Alice Paul started talking about the Equal Rights Amendment in the 50 years since the Equal Rights Amendment passed through Congress. Here is a banner um, from one of those uh, ERA marches in the 1970s. It is um, at Freedom Plaza on, the, on Pennsylvania Avenue for the Women's March in, in 2018. And you'll notice that uh, maybe the faces look a diff little different and the signs they're carrying are talking about new things. Uh, there are, are other things that people are talking about when it comes to when we're talking about equality. Um, so we think about it. What does the Constitution support? And what do we mean when we say equality? What does equality look like in the 21st century? So I'm going to open it up for questions and comments and to have a conversation, but I'm also going to put a link in the chat to a survey that I'm going to ask the students 
uh, that are on the call to take if you wouldn't mind. We need your help to make these programs great for other students like you. Um, this voluntary survey to answer some questions that will help you reflect on your experience and to give us feedback on the program. For most of the questions you'll be answering on a scale of zero to 10, where zero means the program had no influence on you at all, and 10 means it changed your life. You'll probably answer somewhere in between on the two ends of the scale. For many of the questions, it's perfectly okay if you have different answers for each question. There are no right or wrong answers, so please answer with your honest opinion and work alone to complete the survey. Your responses will help us improve programs like this for the future. So I'm going to put that link in the chat while we, um, while we get some, some questions or some thoughts. And teachers, um, I can also send a um, a hard copy, you know, a PDF of this survey if you'd rather have your students do it that way. So thank you so much, all the students that are willing to do that survey for me. Um, and um, I'm ready for thoughts, questions, conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. That was fantastic. We do have one question so far. It's, can people come and visit the National Women's Party headquarters? So um, you certainly can come and look at the outside of it. Uh, I noticed, uh, put on that picture the scaffolding that is there. The site itself is under construction, uh, getting some much needed rehabilitation work done to it. We, we closed for COVID and then never reopened and, and now it's being fixed. Um, so you can't come inside right now, um, but we're hoping that with the new, uh, with the renovations and some updates to the exhibits, we hope um, that we'll be able to welcome people in person in 2023. But in the meantime, um, I can come to you virtually and take you on a virtual tour and tell you some more stories. Yeah, and are there any resources online for people to learn more about Belmont Hall and, and the Women's Party's headquarters? Yes, so we uh, our our website. I'm going to put a link to two places into the chat. One is the um, is our website, the the main website for uh, Belmont Paul. But then also because we just hit the hundredth anniversary of the Nineteenth Amendment, um, we've been very fortunate that there's been a lot of work done on our website. Um, to add women's stories, women's history, all kinds of different uh, biographies and articles and podcasts and all kinds of things you can find out on our women's history, the MPS Women's History Subject site. So I put that link in the chat as well. Awesome, thank you. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in right now. Oh, Dale is not seeing the links. They were just added now, Dale. So let us know if you still can't access them. Um, but thank you again so much, Susan, for sharing all of this information, this exciting story and how it's still going on today. I learned a lot. I hope that all of our students on the call learned a lot as well. Oh, let's see, Sharon, it's not oh, seeing the links as well. Not seeing the links, huh? Oh, okay. Can edit. Did I put it in wrong? Oh, you know what? Uh, it was on there for hosts and panelists. So let me change that so that everyone can see it. Let's see. Okay, this is the um, subject site. Can I, can people see that now? I hope. I hope. Yep. And I put in the main EPO one, so they should. Okay, be great. There now. Thanks, everyone. And um, there's a there's a link on that page that says contact us. So if you have any other questions or you would like on, to set up another um, program or I could come to your group or your classroom in person if you're local or um, virtually if you're not, um, please contact us there and we'd love to love to bring you more of these stories and the 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 ongoing struggle for equality. I saw that Dale put in there, you know, that that uh, we were talking about sort of that binary men, men and women, but um, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, and the struggle for equality has many different facets and layers. And, and we'd love to keep telling more of those stories and thinking about those things. Absolutely. 
Okay, well, thank you everyone. And thank you, Susan. And we hope to see you all again on future programs, but have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.